that mean it's time to begin? Kind of. Not quite. Anybody going to introduce the event? Say some flowery words or not? I was actually kind of hoping you will introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, welcome everyone to this uh, 20th inter iteration of Microzvuk in uh, long space. And uh, as you might have guessed, this lecture will be in English. So I hope that it's okay for everyone. And uh, yeah, I will let you. Thank you so I much. Like your thing. And <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks so much <laughs> for inviting me to this beautiful space. And sorry, I'm speaking in English. <laughs> I was asked very specifically to talk and to play, to mix performance with explanations. So there could be like 50% talking, 50% playing, or 60% or 70. It all depends on the feeling of the crowd. Basically, I'm going to talk to you today about my experiences making music together with other creatures, birds, whales, bugs, and just whole environments. And uh, I'll start by showing little examples of how I got into this, and then I'll, at various points I will stop talking and play along, as if I was out there, maybe, with these other species. So my name is David Rothenberg. I came here from the United States. I live in upstate New York. And uh, right here we have the very moment, I think, where I first realized it might be interesting to play along with another species. That actually is me. And it's like 21 years ago. It's in the National Aviary in Pittsburgh, like 6 a.m. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
that we don't have these birds in Slovakia to play a Slovakian overtone flute along with it. But I think that 
This is a pretty good instrument for playing along with a lot of birds. I hope people are doing it here. If not, I'm going to come back and do it in the spring. But the hermit thrush, I think if you slow it down even more, it gets to be something in the humanly musical realm. And here we have this printout of the sound frequency against time. A lot of you might have seen these. If you see something like horizontal and clear, it's like a steady tone. This is higher up. This is time. It's going to start moving. When you see kind of messy, kind of a lot of layers, it's a more complicated sound. But this is like instant score that can help you make sense of what's in the music. It's the same thing you just heard, slowed down even more. Maybe a different instrument comes to mind. to the realm of uh, like possible music, but you know, you hear scales, but they're not quite scales we're used to using, it moves around, it might seem out of tune, the shape and form of the rhythm might not be familiar, but I think there's this musical sense there, that if you expand your sense of who can be making music, what can happen, that it really, you know, can expand your sense of musicality, and so birds are the natural place music in, among other species. And how did they get these songs? Like uh, this, you know, is something Charles Darwin wrote about in The Descent of Man. He said, birds have a natural aesthetic sense. They appreciate beauty. That's why they evolved these beautiful feathers and these beautiful songs. And it wasn't necessarily for a clear and very practical purpose. In addition to natural selection, like survival of the fittest, he talked about sexual selection or aesthetic selection where just weird, cool stuff evolved. Because one sex was had these features, did these things, and the other one just said they liked that over the generations. And sometimes you get kind of extreme, very complicated bird songs. A peacock's tail with weird, excessive colors, a lot of work to, to carry around. And yeah, so birds immediately suggest something musical that people might not hear so easily with bugs, like these 17-year cicadas in Lake Springfield, Illinois. Probably there's just as many inside my shirt at this point. 
pretty hard to focus. <laughs> and of course, it's just a wash of noise. There's literally millions at this point, and they're all sound here like they're just making one sound, but they're making a lot of sounds. So, uh, this is more likely to convince people that this guy is crazy. <laughs> but, there's a long history of people hearing music and insect sounds as well. This is a painting by the American artist Charles Birchfield, who lived in Buffalo. He called it the Insect Chorus, and next to it he wrote a list of all the species he pointed out that he was visually representing their overlapping rhythms and shapes and shh kind of sounds out in the August afternoon outside his house in Buffalo, New York. But visually he's representing these overlapping insect sounds. Fireflies synchronized with blinking their glowing parts, forming rhythms and bugs kind of do the same thing, like the snowy tree cricket, which is this big, a tiny, tiny little thing. Very beautiful, more often heard than seen. This sound is very common in July, August. That could be one, that could be 10 or 20, all synchronized together. How do they do it? We'll get to that. But this too is a kind of, you know, evolved, sexually selected trait. The males are doing this. And I turned this into a whole piece of changing these crickets different pitches and slowing it down and speeding up and I'm going to join in with that now.
crickets do this? How, how can they synchronize? They didn't quite do all what I played at the end. That was me taking one sound and expanding. But what they do is synchronize all together. And, and uh, I don't know, surprising or not surprising, there's a lot of scientists studying what goes on in the brain of these crickets. And they basically figured, found single neurons that lead, you know, the cricket hears a sound that's like its own sound, moves its own sound a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer until they synchronize. That's all he needs to do. It's called a phase delay mechanism. And uh, you can get them to synchronize. So does that really work? So my friend VJ Manzo, who's a good Max for Live programmer, who created this like, uh, you know, this Max for Live patch. That, let's, we have a bunch of crickets. Let's make them have different pitches and make them listen to each other, see if they automatically synchronize. So if you start this, you can try this yourself. They're all in different places, they kind of synchronize. People are not dominating, their sounds aren't dominating, they're all sort of fitting in into the soundscape. They're not getting in the way. Now we've got up to here. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is. suggests a whole environment of sounds in which people might actually could fit in if they live the right way. This is the documented in a film, which I was lucky to work on when I lived in Berlin. Song from the Forest, about the work of Louis Sarnow, who's like this American guy who just heard pygmy music on the radio one day and said, I must go there. He went to Africa and stayed there for 35 years. He wasn't a musicologist. He wasn't a, a sort of official student. He just recorded their sounds. There's 1,500 hours of recordings from the forest, people and creatures, that are all online now through the, uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford University. There's a clip from the film, which I won't show you today, but you can watch it. You know. All right, this is like maybe the single most beautiful sonogram <laughs> of one cicada sound. Why I like it so much? Because it just shows that even this one cicada sound is like a musical phrase because it begins with this like kind of motion and then it has like this these tones mixed together with noise and it kind of has an exact shape it's just so worked through you know it's, it's not a noise without a structure it's such a structured exact planned noise you might not like this noise when you hear it depends how much you like weird noises but it looks very beautiful This is what the male cicadas 
feeling vibrating something in this part of its body called the timbal and it just does it and then another one might be in the background keeps doing this and hoping that some female cicadas might be there. But look how, how beautiful it is. The sound is so shaped. Sometimes we need to see what's in there to get a sense of what's actually there. So when you hear it, you can't pick up all this stuff. Okay, uh, we're lucky that the 17-year cicadas, of which there are millions at any time when they're out, that they're not as loud individually or people would be deafened by it. When you hear a bunch of these things, At first, it just kind of sounds like noise, but when you learn what's going on, there's actually three different species, and each one makes up the four different sounds, like 12 different sounds are going on here. Most strange sounds, the more time you spend with them, the more interesting it gets, the more you hear what's really going on. And uh, these creatures have an interesting name in Latin, Magicicada septendecim. When these were discovered and named, people realized they were just like magic baboons, like crazy. They just come out every 17 years, otherwise you don't see them. And there's different populations of them called broods. And this only happens for some reason in the eastern United States. There's some theories about that. But this is the cicada guide, you know, when you want to find them. This year was a brood X year, brood 10. They came out around here, in New Jersey and Maryland and down here. Uh, you know, the broods I've gotten to know were in uh, 2011. Uh, was, uh, was um, you know, this last one here. And then 2012, 2013... Uh, 2000, uh, let's see, 2016, and, uh, and th then I took a few cicada years off, and then 2021, <laughs> right? And so, although I did, when I first heard them, I was, I think, I was born in a cicada year, so when I first heard them when I was 17, I go, that's crazy, what are these things? And then when I was 34, it was like, hmm, they're back, yeah, and then, then Somewhere in between, I decided next time when I come back, then I'm going to do something with this. And that's how I got involved in this cicada, crazy cicada music project. But this is where to find them. 2024 is a big year. The 17-year and 13-year ones will converge. Oh, so that's not, this is the 17-year map. It doesn't have the 13-year ones. So why, why these 17 and 13-year cycles? There's No one really knows. This is how it all happens. People ask, how long do they live? They actually live underground for 17 years. They're alive all that time, waiting, thinking when to come out. Of course, being imperfect living creatures, some of them mess up and come out one year early. <laughs> Where is everybody? Where's the party? When they're out, they're around for a few weeks only, when they sing, fly, mate, and die. And then the, the eggs are laid, and the, the, and the, you know, the nymphs hatch. They hatch and go back down. And it's, it's an amazing cycle. And here, here is the moment to look the most common sound from the septendecim is the pharaoh sound. Pharaoh, pharaoh. But when you have millions of it, it kind of merges into a drone. I wanted to test if it really happened, so I took one and just duplicated it. Where the tails disappear and it gets to be more drone like. It kind of works. The drone part takes over. You know, unlike most other tiny creatures, there's so many cicadas around, they're very easy to film and spend time with and study. And in fact, though, there's so many of them around in these three different species that scientists start to pay attention to them. So they have to do something else than just make this pharaoh sound and hope the females will find them. What if they find the wrong species? They have to be able to tell each other apart. 
So it turned out they had this very complicated mating ritual involving these sounds. Nobody thought insects could do anything this complicated, listen to each other, until uh, John Cooley and Dave Marshall just discovered this simply by going out and listening and watching, no fancy equipment. So this is what actually happens, they discovered this. The male calls. And he's hoping a female is going to flick her wings. She can't make this sound, but she can flick her wings. It's actually a lot quieter. A wing flick. And then, if he hears that the right time, the right number of milliseconds after the last time, then he's going to do it again. And then, maybe nothing happens, but if he hears it again, he moves on to the second call type. You might think this is a big deal, that it's, it's so, uh, you know, so what? Then the third one, then when mating actually happens, he makes this sound. <laughs> Some people think this and go, boy, look at these stupid cicadas, but you know, human mating might not be that much more complicated. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, nobody thought that these insects could have this amount of diverse stuff. The crickets just have the one sound. So this is a major discovery and kind of very crazy. And just shows, but just shows what you can find out by listening. Uh, they, you know, cicadas like weird sounds. I think they like iPads a lot. Maybe iPads are invented solely to play along with cicadas. This is, this is 2011, was like the early days of iPad music. So. The inventors of Animoog, the software, they were quite intrigued by the cicada connection. Yeah, yeah. But I have to say, personally, this process got me interested in different kinds of electronic sounds that before I was kind of ignoring. So this is important. This is recorded live just in Virginia with cicadas. Uh, they were pretty cooperative. You could bring them in to play concerts, and um, no cicadas were harmed. You set them up on the microphone. They kind of just sit there for a while, and they'll start to make sound. Unfortunately, we don't have these cicadas around anymore, but we have their sounds, so I can sort of recreate what it might have been like to be there. This was in uh, Urbana, Illinois, 2011. Like settling on
kind of wanted to like explore this idea, this pharaoh makes the other sound just sort of stretched out. Yeah, and you, you change the pitch, you adjust it, the more time you spend with these sounds that you kind of feel more what it might like to actually be, to actually be a cicada. Sing, fly, meet, to die. This is their philosophy. This is a t-shirt. Not as nice as the t-shirts you make here, but there's a guy in Knoxville, Tennessee, he made a whole line of strange cicada t-shirts. This is my favorite one. And, you know, you also see this idea, you know, I think Plato, I think in the Phaedrus, he talks about cicadas just singing, flying, mating, and dying, and, and not the periodic ones, but they knew, even in ancient Greece, that this insect was just like addicted to music. It, its essence was music. And, you know, in uh, Asia in particular, there's this, uh, this, this love of insect, insect poems. Cicadas sing, know not how soon they all may die. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're just doing it and they have no idea where it's going. And this one is an epigram for my book, uh, Bug Music. Some hear bug music, some hear people music. All depends on your ears. Of course, some of these bugs are hearing with little hairs on their legs. Touching the sound in a way. So, uh, the sound I'm going to play here, which I, I couldn't resist because it sounds so good to your speakers, is like synthetic sounds based on this, this one recording I heard of uh, somebody listening to molecules inside the mosquito's brain <laughs> so that you could hear at the molecular level whether the mosquito was dead or alive. And it's not that mosquito esque, but it's just a crazy sound. And some of these, uh, these pieces on this bug music record that I made are really like emulations of like an insect way of making music rather than all made out of their sounds. make music with whales. This is how you do it. This is the technology you need. This is a very technical place here, so it's all very, nothing is news to anyone here, what you would need to do this. Uh, humpback whales are the most musical of whales, and uh, it should be noted that uh, this is against the law. Don't do it. Could get, they really are, are the whale police out trying to make sure no one's messing with the whales. Here's an example of what might happen when
and difficult to achieve, but it could happen. Here's a video of me doing it. I'm not going to show you off Hawaii, uh, but uh, you can watch it. It's easy to find. Uh, here's Roger Payne with a gray whale, the guy on the right. This is in the 60s. And this is the guy who uh, first decided to investigate that the sounds of humpback whales as being something like music. He's the, he and Scott McVeigh, the two pioneers of this research, they're both 88 years old, they're still around. And uh, the interesting thing is that nobody knew that whales made sounds until hydrophones were developed by the US Navy and deployed uh, in all across the world's oceans to listen for Russian submarines in the 1950s. And like, we can listen to what the enemy is up to. They were quite disappointed to discover sounds made a lot by whales, which sounded like they could be secret codes, but unfortunately, it was boring to them that it was made by whales, but, you know, being the military, they said, well, we can't let people find out about this. They kept it secret for like 15 years before they decided the world should know. Here's Individually, they sound like moans and farts and grunts and cows, goats, but together the thing is it's kind of organized as a structure which you don't often hear in these more familiar animals. It's actually organized and slow at a pace people can't quite get. That's why Roger Payne and Scott McVeigh wrote this article in 1971. This is the cover of this famous journal, Science. And what's great about it is it looks like this weird abstract artwork or graphic score. And they had to hand trace these things because sonograms in those days were printed on thermal paper. It didn't last very long. It took a long time to print out. Each line is about a minute. And we're all experts in this by now. We can sing along. <laughs> Scientists usually say, <laughs> that this sound, Who's, who are you to say it's beautiful? And no other papers written by scientists on humpback whale song has ever mentioned beauty because they are afraid. But these guys weren't afraid. They didn't care. They were like the pioneers of this, and they're both kind of not normal scientists. They were happy to recognize the beauty that's going on there. I'm going to skip ahead to all this analysis of these things, which you can all look at. They decided also they had to put out not only will we sci get scientists interested in this, everyone should listen to whale songs. So they put out this album, Songs of the Humpback Whale. This is the cover. It's like the White Album. There's no name on it. Inside was a 48-page booklet in English and Japanese saying, listen to these beautiful songs. We shouldn't kill these whales. We've been killing them. That might be obvious to us now, but environmentalists didn't think about whales until this record. It is the best-selling nature recording of all time, a multi-platinum album. It's almost a cliche, whale songs, you know. People forget it was whale songs that got the environmental movement interested in whales. It's what started Greenpeace. It's what eventually led to the moratorium on whaling that most countries in the world follow, which was enacted in 1986 because of the beauty of the song. So the music of nature can change the world and change the way humans relate to it. Around the same time, people started to get interested in a more spiritual sense of being with whales. This famous book, Mind in the Waters, celebrates the consciousness of whales and dolphins. Uh, Joan McIntyre, humans and whales could live together in some kind of beautiful 1970s harmony. You may laugh, but it goes on. You can do it today. Around Hawaii, there's like, a, there's, it's, it, you know, groups of people going out singing with whales, swimming with them. When they're stopped by the whale police, they're naked, the didgeridoos are out. <laughs> and then you jump, you know, the whales are swimming around, and then you jump in. You should not do this, it's totally against the law. People say it's our religion, it's our spiritual practice. We're with the whales, and uh, they usually will leave them alone. <laughs> but if you want to do this legally, just get in the water and wait for the whale to come to you. And if you're underwater, what's remarkable is you can't see them until a certain point, they suddenly come into view because the sea is a little bit opaque, and that's a pretty bizarre moment. 
Some people say when they look into the eye of the whale, like their whole way of being has changed. People always ask me, how do you feel when you're playing with these whales? And I don't have good answers. I just say, I don't know. I, I, I'm just making this music, and I know I can't make it alone. The whales have to be there. I'm not sure what it's doing to me. I don't know what the whale understands, what I understand. It's not a good answer. But it doesn't stop me from taking off my clothes and <laughs> playing along with the whales. I thought, looking at this picture, that people didn't really get this whole sonogram stuff. So I, together with Michael Deal and Data Visualizer, we thought we would ex improve these pictures. I'm just zooming through it to the video version. We added color, make these weird graphic scores. This, is this going to make the whale song more intelligible? And you know, the video really did. People really liked this. I'm going to play along with this. <coughs> this was recorded in uh, Hawaii. <coughs> structure 
It's like some birds, like the nightingale, which I got interested in making music together with. I went to Berlin to do this because I had heard there were nightingales all over the place. And there were a lot of musicians you could get involved. Uh, and also there's a lot of nightingale scientists and they're studying these territories in the Trep Tower Park of each different bird. And these birds come back to the same tree every year. And they migrate to Africa and they fly back and go to the exact same tree. Isn't that crazy? And, and uh, this is secret codes. I don't know what all the codes mean, but I know that bird number seven is a really good one. <laughs> we came back several years to play with him and record with him. And uh, a nightingale song is like this. You probably heard them. And they leave space. They sing back and forth. They're very territorial. Mixture of whistles, beats, clicks, and this one kind of noisy sound here, very important sound here. Ready? That is considered the sexiest sound, according to one scientific paper. The females really love that. And the paper actually says, oh, our evidence suggests the males should just repeat that sound over and over again. And whoever said that doesn't understand music. Like, you can't use your your great effects over and over again. It's like a guitarist in a wah-wah pedal. You, know, you just do it sometimes, unless you're Frank Zappa. But you, you, you just have to like, you know, you see all the complexity here, but that one sound has a special effect. Anyway, so I um, was really interested in this musicality idea I talked about earlier. Could we measure it? Could you, how would you know what's really musical when it comes to birds? So now we have a little period of some scientific diagrams that showed the, the moment when I was collaborating with some bird song neuroscientists who knew how to analyze the data of songs. So here's how it was done. You have these different phrases, and you, you, different color is, is how loud it is. Blue is silence, and dark red is loud. And you kind of show there's silence, different volumes, and the rhythms come like these lines across. And then you can kind of squeeze them together, line them all up. And so in one picture, you can have 6,000 nightingale phrases. That's just insane. This is like big data analysis of bird song. And that's how they were sung. Here they are clustered by similarity. You see they're all pretty different. And then Tina Roske, who's working at the Max Planck Institute of Empirical Aesthetics, she said, well, is, is there any order to how they sing and which order? Different birds sort of did it differently, but the more she looked at it, she couldn't really conclude anything. If you looked at random or the way the birds actually sung, she couldn't figure out anything. They were different, but you know, it seemed like an inconclusive project. And she was very depressed about that time that it's spent. Most birds' song order doesn't seem to be random. Another study said, came up with something different. They said there are orderly birds and disorderly birds. <laughs> the orderly ones being more like composers who have composed an order of these songs, and they stuck to it. Like they, once they started one way, they kept on the trajectory, whereas the disorderly ones went all over the place. She didn't, they didn't say which ones were better or worse. So we wrote this paper uh, trying to investigate musicality. Most of we said, like, you could do it. This is something that could be measured, but otherwise it was kind of inconclusive. So, but later, Tina wrote a paper saying, you know, I did find something we could measure. You know those fast sounds that they're making? They're not exact. They're uneven in the same way human music can be uneven when you repeat stuff, like this piece. If you want to play this piece, you can't sound like a machine. So the uneven evenness was something she could measure in the Nightingale song to show like they have this musicality, something similar to what people do, more kind of fast rhythms. But I don't really care so much about all that. I would really want to get people out to play in the middle of the night with these birds. And so that's what we did. We got different musicians from all over the world who were living in Berlin to go out and play all manner of sounds with Nightingales. iPads, once again, are good. You could sample the birds live and play right along with them. Sometimes you don't really like hearing their exact sounds back when you kind of change the pitch and brought them down. It does get them really interested. Because they like to play with sounds. Nightingales, at least in Berlin, come to, come to a noisy place. They just want to be there. But you know, if they're competing with us, they're going to win. We'll do this for a few hours and the nightingales will do it all night. 
Uh, we made a film about this, Nightingales in Berlin. You know, how could you resist such an idea? And uh, we showed it different places. Here's a little bit from it, I think. I can't remember which section. And it's low. It's my first time to play with a free bird. As I was a kid, we used to have a canary, but in a cage. Then we started, me and my brother, whistling for him. So it was like as if we are three brothers, not two, but one very sad in a cage. Is this tree today his home? What about tomorrow? Does he care about tomorrow? So um, all 
these projects, you know, the more time you spend playing with another species, it's like playing with other humans you might not know at first, and it can change your own music. Here's an example of one recording from Helsinki where I'm kind of playing along with this uh, one bird. This is when I've done this for so many weeks. By this point, I was totally sick of it, and I thought that this was completely pointless. And, they, and Helsinki never gets dark. The birds are not happy with that. They, they want to hide, but you can see them. They don't like that. So there's a sense of animosity, I think, going on here. But I feel like in this moment, I was starting to change my approach to be very nightingale-like. Interesting is 
if you, if you use a, uh, the kind of hydrophones used in oceans for whales, they pick up nothing. But uh, there's an artist in Brooklyn, Zach Poff, who's making a different kind of hydrophone that picks up near field sounds. And so they are, um, it's much more noise that's there. If you stuck that in the ocean, it would just be too much noise. But you hear in ponds this strange mixture of plants and animals. That's an insect. The background sounds are most likely plants. And again, these are sounds you only hear underwater. Above water, there's nothing. There's a little debate among the scientists whether that increasing sound is a plant or an animal. I think it's actually a plant, like exchanging oxygen with the air. Here comes the creature. That's like a bug. So it might sound like nothing to start, but you sense the musical possibilities. It's like a whole different world where it turns out it's very hard to tell, separate one sound from another. Because you're like mysterious insects. So I decided we could try and make music with that. This one is actually too much is going on, so we're going to move to a special, uh, just made for you, sonogram of the pond. So you can follow along. Hey. 
It should be said this phenomenon was discovered by the Swedish entomologist in the 1950s. You know, Frey Ossia Nilsson. He wrote a book called Insect Drummers. Everyone should read it. And he's just listening with a glass tube to what's vibrating on the leaves. And people thought he was crazy. They didn't believe any of it. It was like that guy in America who saw canals on Mars. They thought this vibration things. He said that little leaf hoppers are vibrating the, the leaves. They said, you're crazy. They don't do things like that. And he was decades ahead of the mainstream of science that used more expensive technology to find out the same stuff. You know, so sometimes you can just go out there and pay attention and find all kinds of weird things. Yeah. Okay, so we can actually play with all these different species. So uh, can you also explore the difference between just playing over each other, not influencing your music, and then actually play this? You, mean, you react to it, and it also reacts to like, your like music. Like everything, like the whole reacting? Yeah. Like, like not just one species? Yeah, you can see that, like playing along with the dawn chorus of birds. Although I haven't studied it, whenever you do it, you, you see that all these individuals do listen to each other, and that having another, another sound there does change the whole thing. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're individual species are paying more attention to other species than, than is usually recognized, and, and this is starting to change in, in birdsong science. They're recognizing that, the, you know, that the, the, the chaffinches listen. To the to the yellow hammers and things like they, they actually from one species to another they do pay attention. Where the previous idea is that the bird is just listening for an individual in its own species, that seems to not really be true. But we don't really understand the whole interconnection so much. But it's probably a good idea to go out there and just play music with it, and see what happens. We don't even know why birds sing at dawn. Why do you think they do? Anyone have a good idea? No one's been able to figure it out. But it happens. Yeah, but I mean more like how often they listen to you actually. Oh, you know, as a, they listen, it depends on the bird. Some bird, bird species are interested in sound, like nightingales just love sound, so they're just responding to different sounds. What they do in response, you know, they have like 150 different phrases they can use, and the nightingales do use things that are hard for them to do to sort of show that they're better than you. Like when the nightingale goes, <laughs> to show like I can do that like 40 times can you, you know, they, they, at least that's one theory we don't really know this is more like you know science is placing the theory that they're trying to show off do things that are difficult to sort of demonstrate their prowess and things like that in kind of competitive light but you know another view of what groups of birds do is that it's more collective that they just sort of sing together and make this kind of jam session mentality which has been observed in various species and so they you know they depending on the species whales change their song. So there's instances where the whale starts to do something totally unlike what he usually does when he hears a clarinet or somebody singing or something. Mm -hmm. Strangely enough, they're more interest likely to respond. And then again, insects respond very generally to sound. So it's just as a cicada will, will, will sing when it hears a lawnmower or a truck. It's going to sing when it hears weird instruments as well. They're, more, they're responding more generally, even though they do specific so underwater, it's, also, it's hard to know. You know. The sound travels from above water to underwater if I'm playing live with these pond sounds. You do start to feel you're having some effect, but you're not sure if it's really there. You know, again, unless you test it and do it a thousand times. Because you, know, you, you make something together that wouldn't make sense apart. You can't always tell what's cause and what's, what is effect. I notice when I take a speaker out and play the underwater sound above water, all kinds of other creatures join in when they hear this because they haven't heard it and sort of is another addition to their soundscape. So that's interesting, but I haven't studied it. Yeah? Uh, do you ever play with frogs? Uh, just a little bit when they're mixing in with the other pond sounds, but it, uh, I should do more of that. I, I, we that have very wild frogs, for example, here in Petrozelka. Yeah? Like next to this uh, canal in the summer, it's uh, quite loud. Yeah, that would be interesting. And yeah. the, the way they use sound is similar to the way crickets do, the way they synchronize and you know, come together and then stop, and you know, it relates to what insects are doing. But uh, I think it's a good idea. And of course, some, some parts of the world there's very strange frog sounds that are sort of like bird songs. And there's so many creatures out there doing strange musical things that, that no one's bothered to pay attention to. And so there's an endless realm of more. How 
long have you been doing this? Well, you saw when I, the moment when I started, that was like year 2000, so that's like 21 years. Before that, I was aware that it could be done. I just hadn't done it. And when I was a teenager, I heard there was this jazz musician named Paul Winter who played with wolves in Wales. And he lived pretty close to where I, where I live in Connecticut, so I got to know him a bit. But I didn't start doing it myself until years later. I was also influenced by the Canadian composer Murray Schaefer, who just passed away a few months ago. And when he turned 60, there was a big conference in Canada. I went to that, and a lot of people I suddenly learned were interested in this from all over the world. I had no idea. You know, and I realized there was a community of people thinking about this. And it's only grown since then. There's way more people interested in music and nature. And it's not, I think it's a good thing. I mean, one reason is just people have been forbidden from doing other stuff the last year and a half. So there's been a huge growth in interest in field recording and listening because all these musicians can't travel and play, so they go out and listen. And I think that we're at the verge of a ex big expansion of, uh, of people becoming more sensitized to, more aware of, more interested in this kind of world of natural sound. So you should all go out there and do it. You're lucky that you live somewhere where such amazing microphones are made. <laughs> Millions of years. When did they start? Millions of years ago. And dinosaurs probably did it too, the ancestors of birds. There's so, some speculative science on what, what goes on. The heads of the Parasaurolophus maybe to a resonator to make cool sounds. But, and uh, what, I was on a panel a few years ago with this expert on the music of Olivier Messiaen. And some, someone asked me, do, do you think birds are really making music? I said, I know they're making music. I'm not sure if humans are making <laughs> the birds are doing this thing that works, that's necessary for millions of years. We have no idea what the point of our music is. It's going to probably die out in a few hundred years, and the birds will still be making this music that needs to be made. You know, so we should take it seriously. We should strive to do something as eternal and lasting. If we could do anything to keep going that long. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really important what you said in your bass music book, that actually humans learn how to for reading that, yeah, I mean, that I, that I um, yeah, I mean, human music evolved in the kind of rainforest situation, you know, like we heard before with the Bayaka in Africa, they're singing along with their environment, and all around the world, whenever you have people living closer to nature, they're making music and rhythms and dancing together with the other species and the sounds around. That's where our interest in all these regular rhythms and, and cool noises began, because it was all around. That's the sonic world that music came up. And people often say, oh, well, dancing and music must come from walking or the heartbeat or something. Come on, people live together with other species, tremendously aware of the world around them. Only recently we just started thinking that me, me, ourselves, me, I'm all that matters. For thousands of years, people needed to live closer to nature and pay attention to everything and be able to hear just to survive. So I think music began as this kind of interspecies It's always different. I mean, cumulatively, you, know, you go to the pond, the pond through every year, throughout the months of the year changes completely. Like maybe it's all water, and by the end of the summer, it is like all filled in with plants. You know, when it's cold, different times of year, totally different sounds. Uh, there's one of these ponds I go to, beavers are working on the dam, they totally change where the pond is, where it isn't, so like the trail is just missing. And o over time, cumulatively, um, in Berlin, some places I go, they, they, you know, they change, they're building more things, some like construction comes in, and what used to be the woods. Nightingales in Berlin seem to, they don't care. They, they love, they're you know, the woods, they're in front of buildings. They're, they, they like acoustic situations where the sound echoes some of the places that makes them louder. They seem aware of that. Um, yeah, it, it's always different. It's always worth doing. Sometimes I think that, oh, I already have enough. I've been to this place enough times. Whenever you go, some strange thing happens. Particularly when you listen in ponds, there's always some weird thing. You have no idea what it is. Like if I did this every day, I'd find so many strange sounds, I wouldn't know what to think of all of it. In 
I may ask, what was the what was the strangest sound or that I've ever heard in my life? Yeah. <coughs> The strangest bird song is probably the Albert's lyre bird of Australia. This bird um, has a song with these complicated different sections. It starts out with this call, you know, announcing to other males, "Here I am." It goes whoop 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 whoop. Okay, and he's ready to begin, and then he imitates all these other birds around, but only their noisiest sounds. It makes the weirdest. That's a noise artist. And, and, and also he's doing it in the winter. No one else is singing. It's as if he's trying to convince the females, it's really springtime. You should be interested in this. Everyone else is silent. The other birds who make these sounds are sometimes looking at the lyre bird like, no, wrong time to be singing this. They even make the sound of flapping their wings. They could flap their wings and go, but they just do it like a human pretending to go. And then they do this dance. They, they step up on a place where the vines are hanging down they flip their peacock-like tail feathers over their heads so they look like a dome, and then they make a sound like an AM radio tuning into outer space. <laughs> and then they do this dance, this percussive dance, going... <laughs> and then they start again. This whole thing. And this guy who studied this one particular bird for 35 years, who he named George, he goes, okay, like, You've been watching this bird a long time. Do you ever see him mate? Does he ever get mate? He goes, maybe like twice. <laughs> and the guy goes like, I reckon it's all sheer frustration. <laughs> But that's just an insane sound. And it certainly proves that these birds are not just making random stuff, that they really have evolved whole structures, and musicality, composition, all this kind of stuff. How these lyre birds manage to evolve that, you know, Nobody knows why, except that in Australia there aren't really any native predators. So they have millions of years to develop very refined ways of life. In Australia also has bower birds who make sculptures in the woods. And they just collect, <laughs> one needs to collect all blue things and arrange it around this abstract form, and another one builds something like a Christmas tree and decorates it with little bits of the dead caterpillars and attaches them. They're so complicated. And they're not nests, they don't have a practical function except they're like these sculptures. And they hope the females come, they look at it, like I said, like art critics, and we go to the next one. And some of the other bowerbird artists go and steal things from this work and go put it on theirs. And so much time is spent on this. And if there were any predators that knew what was going on, they could just grab these birds, but there aren't. So that's why um, you know, it may have evolved. But it definitely shows evolution sometimes present, produces the need to make art. So... Uh, Yeah, lyre birds are pretty strange. Even starlings, very common birds that you see around here in uh, flocks and millions with their murmurations and shapes. If you actually listen to one sit and sing, he sings this totally avant-garde, one-minute song that's full of all kinds of complexity. And uh, the great bird song scientist Peter Marler, when I was interviewing him, he said, yes, the song of the starling, barely a minute in length, at the very limits There's a lot to feel in awe of and be, be amazed by, even like familiar birds that are right around. Yeah. Uh, you have you have a lot of respect for like the species and where they come from, and the, that's not always the case with people studying animal cognition. And uh, when people study, uh, like there's this classic experiment of people trying to teach uh, apes how to communicate with uh -huh. sign language. So you could theoretically, I guess, also do that with music. Uh, have an interest in trying to teach that, but uh, would you be interested in that at all? Do you think it can even be done? Is I'm a little bit interested. Yeah? I, mean, I don't like the idea that much of keeping the bird in the cage. Like yeah, Rassim is saying, like, a, a, one is a free bird, and one is a caged bird. And, mm. and uh, I, I like the idea, mm -hmm. but I, I'd sort of rather do it with a bird in the wild. And also over this pandemic period, there was this cat bird, which also makes this annoying song that most people don't like, but it's really complicated and interesting. Only part of it sounds like a cat. They might go like, meow, meow, but then they go, ah, it's just so out there. And this bird would always come after dinner time next to the table outside and start to sing every night. So then I would start playing with him, playing electronics and clarinet. He'd always be there. So we, we worked on this stuff for a while. <laughs> and we, we made some interesting sounds. This year he, he was back, but wasn't so into it. You know, wasn't making so much music. I don't know why. 
I know what was going on. I think it was the pandemic mood affected the animals too. <laughs> really, I mean, many people would say that, like last year there was just so many weird things that you started to see that you wouldn't see. Also in my backyard, this large rabbit, which you'd never see around there, like a hare, would just come like right in front of everyone while people are sitting there, going to the garden, just eat things while we're sitting there, and then just go away. You know, that, never saw that. And that, I think during this pandemic year in the beginning, there was a lot of strange animal stuff. So I, I like the idea of spending time with individuals here and seeing what happens. But also giving them a mode to make music that they would not usually have? Yeah, I'm always doing that, but I'm not doing it in a scientific way. I'm just sort of playing along and seeing what they do. And they do change things. They do change. It's not like they're always going to copy you, but they're going to they, they're use their repertoire. So I am interested in that. I mean, both, both what scientists are doing and what I'm doing on my own or working together with scientists, all of it can, uh, any, any new human knowledge can change what we make sense of with the world. Mm. Like, like, you know, in good and bad ways, of course. But, but you know, it all helps to make sense of what's going on out there by, by calling attention to things that were previously overlooked. You can find, uh, just find out more about the world around us. And, you know, the way of making music is very kind of innocent and interactive and immediately can be interesting. But if you want to make claims and say the birds are doing this or the birds are doing that, with any certainty, the traditional way is you collect a lot of data and say, look, 85% of the time the bird did this. But you know, another view suggests that the intuition of a moment, one moment, can be just as valid. It's just a different kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to recognize it's a different kind of knowledge. And I think that the best scientists and the best musicians recognize that their approach isn't necessarily better than the other. They're different and they complement each other. Like, you know, you know, the best evolutionary biologists say evolution is a pretty weak theory. It doesn't explain all that much. There's so much else going on, we don't know what it is. Instead of saying everything is explained by natural selection. It's everything has a purpose and exact reason. Everything, that, the reason the, the uh, lyre bird has this amazing sound, complicated songs, they're very picky, the females, it's very careful sexual selections, they evolved all this. The other view is that weird, crazy stuff just sometimes evolves. It doesn't have to be useful. And I think that's, uh, that's maybe the, the difference between the hard you know, evolutionists that says everything has an exact purpose to someone who would say evolution leads in many circuitous ways. If you wind it back a million years, a few million years, start again, you're going to get different species. Nothing we have now was was inevitable. You know, it's not like had it not, didn't have to go in this direction. And I think that's important to note that it, it's still you're still f having a scientific evolutionary world view, and you can believe that weird, crazy stuff can evolve, and nature can be beautiful. You can be courageous as a scientist and say humpback whale songs are beautiful. This is still scientific. You don't have to have data for everything. If this makes any sense, you know, it's a, as a musician, you don't have to think about all this, but you should know, like you know, what's known, what's not known, what can happen. A lot of people go out and, and they make some music with a different creature, maybe not a lot, but some, and they say, "Oh, I discovered something incredible." You know, this bird listened to me and changed things. It's like, yeah, maybe, but it's not going to impress the scientist unless you have this data. But musically, you can say, "Here, look at this beautiful." But I, I like working with scientists and getting them to think about what beauty is, what what music is, and I, and I also like going out there and interacting when you have no idea what's going on, what it actually means. You learn something by making you expanding your sense of what music can be. And it's like, oh, I went to school. They said music is humanly organized sound. I'm like, well, why human? Like any any species can organize sound in these beautiful ways from the theory that's meeting along the humpback whale and the. Song that goes on for 24 hours. 
they're not necessarily doing it for a simple reason, just like we're not making music for simple reasons. We're making it for all kinds of reasons and emotions and you know why. So. Yes. Well, I, I just want to ask if we think at some point it will be possible maybe with AI to, to drop directly translate animal song. You know, I, I've been I've met with these people who believe that. There's a, there's a group called Interspecies IO, which is a gr group started by Silicon Valley people and uh, scientists and MIT. And you can look at the videos of the th various conferences they've had. I've been to, to uh, one of them in person and two online. And you know, this guy, Azar Raskin, who started this, who's the son of the inventor of the Macintosh, Jeff Raskin, you know, he's convinced that, look, we put in French and German, we gave it to the, this, you know, this AI that knew nothing and the translation was 90% perfect. We could do the same with dolphin sounds. And I said, well, you know, like those French and German people, they're basically doing the same thing with different words, but what are the dolphins doing? Something totally different. Why do you think this approach could even have hope of working? And then she stopped and said, hmm, I guess that's a fair critique. <laughs> and then went on to be very enthusiastic about it. And said, because like, why would we trust this, this random kind of machine approach more than people thinking about it and seeing how complicated it is? So you have to observe the behavior of animals, and see where the sounds come. I, I wouldn't, it could be useful to do that. And it, it might be very useful to generate statistics analyzing sound and into patterns and stuff. But you know, so far it hasn't necessarily been better than people going through the data. You kind of need the computer number crunching together with humans to get the best results so far. But I'm not someone who necessarily trusts that machines doing crunching all these data on their own is going to get better results than people. But I'm certainly willing to see what happens. Because whenever I see what artificial intelligence recommends for me, like what music I should listen to and stuff, it, all, it seems a lot more random than people. And we, we know more than our machines do still, but you know, it could change. That idea has always been there, of course, whenever the next machine technology is there, it's going to be better than people, better than humans. I was talking, I'm, I'm, there's this woman who, who has written this interesting book on, on plant communication, who's Italian, who lives in, in uh, Australia, I forget, Monica Gagliano or something, I think is her name. And I was asking her about this very thing. And she says like in her book, you know, these people who can collect data from plants and turn it into sound and music and stuff, they're not really paying attention to the plants. They're just taking the plants, collecting some information from them and turning them into something else. And she felt that you know, to really, if you're gonna make music with plants, you have to spend time with them, listen to them in a more, and this is a scientist speaking, in a more intuitive way, rather than take some information from them and turn it into sound. But that's something a lot of people do. It's, it's usually called sonification. You take some data and turn it into something else. And with that, yes, you could take data from plants, from water, from the air, and turn it into all kinds of music. But I think she does have a point that if we really want to listen to plants, we don't want to just turn it into data. And I try and, I really like to get things out of the sound of the things I'm studying, instead of turning it into data too quickly. Because I know you could turn the data into anything. And it, 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 you end up claiming more from what you do than, than what's actually there. But I, I, I know that you can get beautiful results doing that. But it, it's worth looking into, like, what, What's the real way to get music out of plants? Like I think it's so cool plants underwater are making sounds that are so good made. by doing photosynthesis, by exchanging oxygen with air, that that makes rhythms. That's amazing. You know? But I would be less likely to attach, you know, electrodes to plants and see what comes out. But you know, here we're we're at the center of research in this building for electro turning listening to electromagnetic waves and sounds, and that's kind of fascinating to hear things that are just going around that we usually miss. I haven't tried that out, but I, I wonder what, what, how I feel if I did that. I might get really nervous realizing how many electromagnetic waves there are. But I guess maybe that's the point. Yeah? I actually mentioned just playing data in sound. Yeah. I, I showed how you did the phone music. How much of it is the real sound, and how much is just the noise produced by the hydro. Uh, it's 
good question. You, the, the hydrophone noise is the, the kind of pops that come, but all the regular rhythms and things are made by uh, plants and animals, and sometimes the motion of water. But I, I try and do it where the water isn't moving too much. But you can, I can definitely play recordings where all you do is hear noise of, of, of like the hydrophone in the water. It, it's much more <laughs> things like that. But you know that it's a good point. And the deeper the hydrophone is, the quieter it'll be, and the less of, the, of, the, of the, all the noisy stuff you, you hear. The more swampy it is, the more the plants there are, the more tinkling rhythms will be there. And sometimes you hear none of that and just these occasional creatures. Often, of course, you hear nothing, like everything. Often you record, you look for natural sounds, bird songs, everything. A lot of the times, nothing is going on. Of course, it takes, it takes some time, but usually I found you know, at least in the spring and summer. In, in ponds, you hear surprising things. You can't predict what you're going to hear. Like it's usually a certain amount of surprise. Or the place you think is going to be bad ends up being good. And also, sometimes you don't hear anything until you get back home. You can listen to the recordings and look at them to see and hear what's there. So that there's a lot of surprise going on. Just like when you're doing photography and everything else. But this is... I can tell it's a very sophisticated audience that's thought about this. This is rare. And actually, this that of sound, what was the difference between mosquito brain or something? That was more, you know, that, I can play you the mosquito sound that, that, that was in the scientific paper. This little bit, like here's the dead mosquito, and here's the live one. And it's like a little bit of something, and the paper is pages long, and it was mostly that idea and that the, su the sound that inspired me to make that all electronic piece, that didn't come, that one did not come from natural sounds, but okay. the idea of that. And, uh, so it was not inspired by the, the actual recording of the... No, but okay. the actual recording is, relates to it. It's like, you know, yeah. What yes? if, uh, like, have you thought of doing something like quantification, but of movement, so there could be an interactive element? So, I mean, first, when you said the cicadas like the touch pads, I thought you meant like as a, as a like sound, for example, if the cicada walks this, the, the sound changes, and then it would be like... A, uh, like yeah, I couldn't get the cicadas to, do, to make course, any difference course, yeah. on that. They've had their little too, too, too insect-like. Yeah, but, but actually, you could. Happen. You know, it wouldn't be hard. Yeah. I haven't tried that, but that, that's not a bad idea. Okay. I, have see, I have tried these, like, you know, um, you know plugins and apps that are swarm-like, where little things move on your screen. And I do have one of my colleagues run something called the Swarm Lab, Simon Garnier. You can just look up Swarm Lab, and he does experiments like that. He just, he just go, you know, collects ants together and watches what they do. And he had this idea you can make the ants playing music and mm -hmm. stuff. You could do that. And I have done a little bit of sonification in the sense of taking these pond rhythms and mapping them to other sounds, mm -hmm. the bass and drum sounds and things like that, to see what happens, which I guess is a kind of sonification. In, but I'm always interested in what these sounds do to change my sense of what music is. And often the sounds start not, they don't interest me at the beginning and I spend more time with them and I start thinking very differently. Like I know that if, if you spend like a, a few weeks or months listening to pond sounds, you hear these things very differently than you know, people at first just think, what is that? That's just like weird noises. Like I just sent a sound that I recorded the other day in the Czech Republic in this lake that I had no idea what it was. And they were like, <laughs> and then all these sounds in the background. I sent it to some, another one of these crazy pond recorders. Like, what do you think of this? Go, oh, there's so much going on. What sound? You know those big loud sounds? <laughs> I said, oh, I just thought that was a motorboat. I go, it was not a motorboat. That's the weird sound. There was no boats anywhere. <laughs> so he was fixed. He was going towards something more subtle and distant, like the background sounds we hear right here, rather than these big interventions. This recording we're looking at right now kind of relates to what I um, recorded, but, but it was much more diffuse. Like, so I, I don't know what it was. But that kind of interests me, that there can be such surprise. And, and that we started a monthly meeting, any of you can join. Weird pond sounds, what do you think this is? <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing, like the scientists debating with other people Everyone think you know, the scientists say, this is just a, a plant, one single plant. And he goes, no, it couldn't be. And then, and then she'll listen more and say, you know, you know yeah, I don't think it is a plant. <laughs> There's one scientist, Camille de Jonquere, 
who, who wrote her thesis on, on, a, on the whole mass of different kinds of pond sounds in France. So she's the one kind of biggest expert on this, but it's quite inconclusive. Much of it is still unknown. It's more like, well, wait, this kind of sound, this and this and this. Like a lot of stuff, you get more information, you just get more and more confused. But it's fun. Yes? Is there a place where you would say technology gets into the way of your work, or is it always? That's a great question. Yeah, often it gets in the way. You, you think, like, what am I doing? Why all this? Why all this technical stuff? When you start to, I, I used to, for example, play clarinet more into electronic effects, and at some point I started doing less of that. Although, if I knew you have all this amazing sound system, I would have done it today because it started to be like um, too much, too much electronicizing when it was already interesting enough. And sometimes there is a sense of like false positives where you can look at you can look at information technically that looks like there's something there. That that's famous in the study of bird songs and other things like that. Mm -hmm. Looking at something too great a detail that looks in one way on the sonogram doesn't really mean anything. That's pretty interesting to think about. And sometimes you just think, why all this machinery, all this recording? You should just go out there and listen and just take a, you know, take an overtone flute. How, how would you call a small overtone? Konsolka, like with a C K O N, Konsolka. In Norwegian, it's a Seljeflöjta. In the U.S., there isn't such an instrument, so no one knows what to call it. Great. Thanks a lot. Yes, one more. Yes, probably to ask. So you were half joking about the link that was Van Burke number seven, uh -huh. and that it was really good. So is it like you can really recognize Van Burke from another? After some if you time? spend time with him, yeah, you can. And some birds like don't like all this. They, they, they'll, they'll have no patience. And others like, oh, what's going on? Come on, they come closer. You know, they're more interested. And other ones, uh, you know, don't put up with too many people around. And some get more interested. And so, and then I had my friends looking around for different birds and have coming up with these odd things to say about them. Like this one is really, you know, he really <laughs> wants more and things like this. And they come back a few years in a row, the same ones. So. Yeah, and that is also what in the summer is really good when you are singing alone, but then you come to it and sing it, it does. What well, definitely work. happens is when, the, is when the females show up, they, they get all flustered and they can't really sing anymore. So if it's like four of the females, how come they don't do their best singing when the females are around? They start to fumble like, you know, they're like humans, <laughs> you, know, you know. And that's really funny to hear. And there was these people who came out yelling at me, like, you ruined our bird, he was singing so beautifully until you showed up. <laughs> and if you look on the, on the Nightingales in Berlin website, there's a whole comic sort of showing that story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there's all kinds of things. And, and birds, like humans, are individuals. They're all different. They can do very odd things. I haven't noticed that as much with insects. They're harder to get to know on an individual level. But <laughs> some people do keep them as pets, and then you start to learn individual things. Thanks so much. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me.